TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with episode 151, another long requested topic. This one concerns the USA. I hope the 55% of you whose IP address is not located here in the beautiful country don't mind. We haven't had any America-themed topics since Wong Chin Fu, episode number 136, so we're kind of due. America and China began getting acquainted back in 1783, right after we officially became a nation. We looked at that in CHP 127. In the 232 years since the U.S. and China first shook hands, relations between the two countries, well, they've had their ups and downs. Of the old imperialist days in China, we say we weren't as bad as the British or the French, but our hands aren't entirely clean. And since 1949, there's been the Korean War, John Foster Dulles's dissing of Zhou Enlai at the 1954 Geneva Conference, the Vietnam War, the shakeout after June 4th, May 1999 bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, the April 2001 Hainan incident. There's been no shortage of low points in the history of U.S.-China relations. But today's China History Podcast episode is not about one of the low points in Zhongmei Guanxi. Today we look back on one of the high points. Today's story concerns the actions of Americans who left the relative comfort of their nice American lives and went to China to join together with the people there to fight for a common cause, to push back against the Japanese who had invaded China and were causing terrible suffering wherever they went. The history of the Flying Tigers and what they accomplished in their short time on the stage of Chinese history truly is a shining example of cooperation between China and the U.S. In this China History Podcast episode, let's accentuate the positive and focus on one of the times when the U.S. and China came together at a crucial historic moment as friends and allies. If you remember, Japan's march into China began with the end of the Sino-Japanese War and the Treaty of Shimonoseki, the Ma Guan Tiao Yue. In 1895, the 120th anniversary coming up soon as I record this, then the Makden Incident, Jiu Yiba, in 1931, Japan helped themselves to Manchuria, and then finally came the Chi Chi Shirpian, the Marco Polo Bridge Incident, takes place 7737. And between July and December 1937, the entirety of the might of the Japanese military came crashing down hard on China. The Nanjing Massacre stands out as the symbol of this particular period in Chinese history. So horrible were these years following the invasion in July 1937 that even in today's 21st century Sino-Japanese world, the animosity still boils. There are many stories of bravery on the part of the Chinese who resisted Japan in the beginning, but pretty much from this Marco Polo Bridge incident up until the time Uncle Sam recovered from the initial shock of Pearl Harbor, China had gone it alone, and they were getting clobbered. In late 1941, Japan was at the topmost of their game. A lot of things went awry for them, but as far as China was concerned... Japan was unstoppable. Their bombing runs on the East Coast and into Chongqing, Kunming, and other places were deadly. On the ground or in the air, it was a terrible mismatch at this early stage. The USA wasn't in the fight yet. We were neutral. Therefore, no matter where our sympathies might lie, we couldn't go running to China's rescue. That wasn't a viable option until after war was declared. I guess one of the unsung heroes for the Chinese side at this dark hour, would have to be T.V. Song, brother to the illustrious Song sisters, Ai Ling, Ching Ling, and Mei Ling. T.V. Song, with instructions from his famous sister, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, 
talked to his friends in high places in Washington, D.C., and got the ball rolling. And it was TV songs, diplomacy, quick thinking, understanding of the big picture, and most of all, his personal relationships with the key people with direct access to the chain of command that led to the formation of the AVG, the American Volunteer Group. And we know the AVG more popularly as the Flying Tigers. You'd think with all the fame that precedes this fabled name in American military history that their specific role in World War II would have lasted for the entirety of the war from 1941 to 45. But the history of the AVG is only an eight-month-long story. The story of the Flying Tigers is really about how America came to China's aid before FDR said those famous words on December 8, 1941, about the date that would live in infamy. After December 7th, all bets were off. Once we declared war on Japan, there was no need to keep up appearances about being neutral, and no further need for any volunteers as well. And that's what the Flying Tigers were all about, really. We'll see they all get incorporated into the various branches of the service later on, and many of them went on to even more feats of valor and heroism throughout the war. But for the eight months, December 1941 to July 1942, the AVG were exactly what the name stood for, American Volunteers. They volunteered in harsh conditions every time they went up in the sky. They put their life on the line for China and for their own country. Many made the ultimate sacrifice. So let's take a look at the AVG and their heroic story. That this whole thing is true is in itself amazing. There is so much myth and legend intertwined with the reality of what went down in 1941 and 1942. Maybe you know about the 1942 John Wayne Flying Tigers movie and all the hyperbole about their deeds. The claims about the number of planes shot down varies greatly. I relied mostly on Daniel Ford's respected work, Flying Tigers, Claire Chenault and his American Volunteers, 1941 and 1942. It came out in 1991 and was updated and revised in 2007. This latest edition was published by HarperCollins, Smithsonian Institution Press. Daniel Ford is the resident scholar at the University of New Hampshire. I guess you could call him one of the top authorities about the AVG. I know at the end of that T series, I said I was going to get away from these multi-part episodes and do a bunch of single episodes. I was certain this story could be told in a 45 to 50 minute episode, but alas, so soon after my promise, I have to go back on my word, my apologies. Today, we'll look at the circumstances that led to the creation of the AVG. Then next time, we'll look at their story right after Pearl Harbor. That's when all the action really takes place. I have wrestled with throwing so many names at you. There are about 300 pilots and crew involved in the story. Some of the pilots were more famous than others, and some lived on for decades to tell and retell their story. Some died early on during the course of their mission. If I mention one, I have to mention them all. So rather than inundate you with names, let me encourage you to read Daniel Ford's book, and you can wallow in all the minutiae about everyone who played even a small role in this epic story. You will also be treated to a minute-by-minute replay of every air battle that happened down to the most delightful technical detail. I strongly recommend this book. The story of the AVG can be told in part through the telling of the story of General Claire Chenault. I think the correct way to pronounce it was Chenault, but... All the newsreels and history documentaries call him Chenault, so without any feeling of shame, I'm going to follow those lemmings and hop on that Chenault bandwagon. Claire Lee Chenault was born in Commerce, Texas, but his family roots were in the Bayou country of Louisiana. There are multiple accounts as to the year Claire Chenault was born, but it was certainly between 1890 and 1894. The most accepted date is September 6th, 1893. He enrolled in Louisiana State University by the age of 14 and had volunteered for the ROTC program there, Reserve Officer Training Corps. He became a cadet and began his career as an unpopular maverick. Back then, until the day he retired, 
Claire Chenault was someone who didn't always follow the rules. He often had a kind of rebellious streak in him that made him buck authority. I guess you could call this a self-confidence and disdain for those who didn't share his vision, which was usually right. And because of some of his actions and words, this made him unpopular with many. Chief among them later on would be Generals George C. Marshall and Hap Arnold. Those two carried a lot of weight back in their day. I forgot who said this first, but nothing succeeds like success. Chenault, throughout his military career, backed up his words with actions. He wasn't just a big talker. Chenault received his teacher certificate in 1910 and began his career as a school teacher in Athens, Louisiana. In 1911, he married Nellie Thompson. They had eight children together, not all at the same time. The schoolhouse teaching business wasn't any more financially rewarding back in 1911 than it is today. So in 1916, Chenault went to work at a Goodyear tire factory in Akron, Ohio. And like with millions of others, his life took a turn on April 6, 1917, when the USA officially entered World War I. Chenault applied for military flight training. He didn't see any action in World War I, but he did learn how to competently fly a Curtis JN-4, or Jenny as they were called. He had a problem getting into the flight training program, but regardless of these setbacks, he learned to fly and racked up an astounding amount of hours. Pretty much from here on out, Clear Chenault's life was tied to the Air Force and to flying and flight training. He graduated in April 1919 as a pursuit pilot in the 46th Pursuit Squadron. In the 1920 National Defense Act, the Air Force was made part of the Army. 1,500 officers were selected to seed this new American force to be reckoned with. Chenault got a nice plum assignment in 1923, commanding the 19th Pursuit Squadron in Hawaii. Then, in 1931, he became an instructor at the Pursuit School that was relocated at Maxwell Field in Alabama. This was the period in Chenault's life where he developed all the training techniques and lectures about how to fight in the air. In 1932, Chenault took on a job that ultimately led him to the Chinese. The Air Force wanted to create a kind of Blue Angels of their day. These would be a team of three pilots who would carry out all this precision flying and perform all kinds of aerial acrobatics. They were called the three men on a flying trapeze. Besides stunt flying in front of audiences, they carried out all kinds of testing of flight formations and air combat techniques. The prevailing attitude at the time was that bombers were unstoppable once they were in the air. The technology and the technique in the 1930s wasn't good enough yet where fighters could be effective. Chenault's ideas about the importance of early warning systems and utilizing pursuit planes wasn't accepted at first. Flying, even in the 1940s, was still a relatively new industry, and the manual about how to carry out combat was still being written. General Mao Bang Chu visited the U.S. from China and was taken to see a performance of the three men. He was a very close confidant of the Jiangs and ran the flight school in Hangzhou. He also held high-ranking positions in the Nationalist Chinese Air Force and was involved in the procurement of planes and equipment. He was close to the major manufacturer back then, the Curtis Wright Company of Buffalo, New York. At the All-American Air Races held in Miami in December 1935, General Mao was present as the guest of the Curtis salesman, William Pauley. Pauley's story deserves its own episode, but here he played a supporting role in making things happen. Pauley handled Curtis sales to Asia, and he was trying to do some business with General Mao, and it was there that Mao Bang Chu saw Chenault for the first time as he performed stunts with the three men on the flying trapeze. Over drinks afterwards, Mao made an offer to Chenault and his two partners in this group. The offer involved coming to China to teach flying and combat techniques to the pilots of the Chinese Air Force. Chenault had planned to retire by 1937 anyway, so the timing of this worked out nicely. The truth is, though he had another 21 more years to live, he was not in what you'd call very good health. His chronic bronchitis was 
terribly exacerbated by his three-pack-a-day habit. And he wasn't smoking no Merit Ultralights either. Old Leatherface, as some of his associates called him, smoked camels. He never let poor health get him down, though. He was extremely active. Hunted, played tennis, and would stay out late and carouse with the officers, play poker, get liquored up on bourbon all night. He was that kind of guy. And he understood his men. Later on, the American volunteers under his command, who weren't Boy Scouts, would gain a well-earned reputation for their antics that usually offended their Chinese hosts and certainly their British cousins. Claire Chenault knew when to look the other way and when to come down hard. In all those years of flying in open cockpits and around roaring aircraft engines had pretty much trashed Chenault's herring to the extent that by the time World War II came around, his herring was not all there. His health and too many ruffled feathers in the chain of command led Chenault to officially retire from the Army Air Corps on April 30th, 1937, with the permanent rank of captain. Leading up to this, he had kept a dialogue going with General Mao Bang Chu and his people regarding their offer. A two-year consulting deal was worked out between Chenault and the Chinese Air Force. The Chinese government had been trying in vain to establish flight training programs to kickstart their budding Air Force, but all efforts had led nowhere. This attempt to secure Chenault's expertise was not the first time they tried hiring outside help. Chenault worked directly for Madame Chiang Kai-shek, Song Mei Ling. June 3, 1937, he met her for the first time. Chenault wrote, quote, one sultry afternoon, Roy Holbrook appeared and drove me to a high-walled compound in Shanghai's French concession to meet my new employer, Madame Chiang Kai-shek. We were told she was out and ushered in to a dim, cool interior to wait. Suddenly, a vivacious young girl clad in a modish Paris frock tripped into the room, bubbling with energy and enthusiasm. I assumed it was some young friend of Roy's and remained seated. Roy poked me and said, Madam Chiang, may I present Colonel Chenault? End quote. As Secretary General of China's Aeronautical Commission, Song Mei Ling was in charge of building this new Chinese Air Force from the ground up. She wanted Chenault to study the situation and offer up to Chiang Kai shek his best assessment and recommendations. Then he was also to train crews and support in the building of airfields and inspect which of the 500 aircraft in their possession were still usable. Chenault will do as instructed and will come to learn. Only 18% of the aircraft were usable, less than 100. There were Curtis Hawk biplanes, Boeing P-26 monoplanes, and Italian-made Fiat biplanes. It wasn't much, but it was a start. No sooner did Chenault arrive in China when the Marco Polo Bridge incident went down. He was made head of combat training at a school based in Nanchang in Jiangxi. Actually, Mao Bang Chu was supposed to be in charge, but when Chenault arrived, General Ma was gone on some assignment, so fearlessly, Chenault took charge. It didn't matter that he had only been in China six weeks, didn't speak a word of Chinese, and wasn't familiar at all with the culture. No wonder he smoked three packs of camels a day. The training was going to be a hard slog. Chenault found the prospective pilots lacking in talent. Training was poor, non-existent, and the crash rate was dangerously high. When Chenault reported to Jiang Kai-shek about the state of affairs, he didn't mince words and told it like it was. For his straight-shooting ways, Jiang made Chenault his unofficial commander of the Chinese Air Force, the CAF. When initial missions were flown against the Japanese, Chenault was often in the passenger seat as an observer, risking his life with the rest of them. Once on August 14, 1937, a bombing mission to destroy the Japanese vessel Itsumo went awry, and the bomb load fell on the city instead, killing 3,000 Chinese civilians. On September 1, 1937, the Generalissimo put Chenault in charge of Nanjing's air defense. Chenault was instrumental in creating the first of many early warning systems that utilized a network of Chinese watchers spread out over a large area, communicating via radio and telephone. But by the end of 1937, despite all the training and the initial attempts to fight back, the Japanese had worn the CAF down to the bone. 
Despite all the punches being thrown, the Japanese military in late 1937 was simply unstoppable. Jiang sent out SOSs internationally, but only the Soviets came to his aid at this stage. They sent several squadrons of planes, 300 in all, that were all battle-tested in the Spanish Civil War. This assistance lasted until June 1941 and was pulled back after Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa. Once the Soviets bailed, China was once again left standing alone to face the Japanese onslaught. Chenault had written to one of his colleagues, quote, Boy, if the Chinese only had 100 good pursuit planes and 100 fair pilots, they'd exterminate the Japanese Air Force, end quote. This is the earliest time the idea for the AVG was mentioned. In China, during the fall of 1938, came the creation of the International Squadron, made up of a bunch of Western mercenaries who, in the end, proved to be a bunch of goof-offs. All their planes ended up getting bombed by the Japanese, and the whole thing never amounted to anything. All Chenault could do, considering the lack of discipline and attention to training, was shake his head. He was doing the best he could with what he had, but he needed real, trained U.S. military pilots. In October 1940, Chiang Kai-shek and Song Mei-ling told Chenault to head to Washington, D.C. and hook up with TV Song to discuss the procurement of pilots, aircraft, and ground crew. So into the fall and winter of 1940, Pearl Harbor still a year away, Chenault, Song Mei-ling, and William Pauley of Curtis Wright worked on this deal with TV Song for 200 fighters and 100 bombers. If you remember from that old CHP 116 episode on John's service, FDR's point man on China was one of his economic advisors, Lachlan Curry. FDR had sent him to China to get an idea of the situation. Curry came back and assured FDR in no uncertain terms that Chiang Kai-shek's back was up against the wall and the place was falling to pieces and Japan was taken over. It was Tommy the Cork, Tommy Corcoran, one of the first of the great K Street lobbyists, along with pressure from the nascent China lobby in D.C., who showed Roosevelt the light that using the retired Chenault in the employ of the Chinese gave the United States all the plausible deniability it needed. And at the same time, they could help out a friend and use this whole operation as a way to feel out the Japanese. After all, those at the highest layers of government knew... Although we were neutral now, that wasn't going to last, no matter how much the American people wanted to stay out of this war. Henry Morgenthau, George C. Marshall, and Cordell Hull had been the last hurdle. Then, on December 23rd, 1940, they sent the order to FDR for approval. Total cost for all the planes was $4.5 million. Bill Pauley then arranged for the transport of the planes to the port of Rangoon. Chiang Kai-shek had asked for 500 aircraft, but he had to settle for 469. These 200 P-40s and a few hundred other types of aircraft. Thanks to TV Song's access to Lachlan Curry and Tommy the Cork, they had successfully bent FDR's ear sufficiently enough so that our 32nd president signed off on the creation of the first American volunteer group, 100 fighters and crew. The second American volunteer group was slated to have 100 bombers and crew. The third AVG would consist of additional fighter aircraft. And for all this hardware, the Chinese government picked up the tab. I believe they paid with loans we provided, though. The Chinese Aircraft Manufacturing Company, or CAMCO, was hastily set up as the front in China to handle all the procurement of aircraft, parts, and crew. All the paychecks came from Camco. They were the fig leaf that the U.S. used to show their non-involvement. Chenault's deal with China Aeronautical was finalized in Order Number 5987 on August 1, 1941. It said, quote, One, the first American volunteer group is constituted on this date. Two, Colonel Chenault will organize this group with American volunteers now arriving in China to participate in the war. Additional personnel required to complete the organization of this group shall be supplied by this commission. End quote. William Pauley was CAMCO's contact at Curtis Wright. He arranged for the planes to be shipped to Burma, where they were assembled and sent to the AVG base on the Yunnan-China and Burma border at Loi Wing. So you know 
from that 10 part T series that they had access to some great tea while they were there. Recruiting crew and pilots wasn't terribly hard. No one knew what they were getting themselves into. So volunteers came forward quickly. Everyone was attracted for their own personal reasons, but most of all for the high pay relative to a military salary. The pay was $300 a month for crew chiefs and $600 for officer pilots. Everyone who volunteered received travel documents, ticket to California, $100 for incidentals, passage to Burma, and ultimately to China. They were also handed $500 cash to cover their eventual return to the U.S. when the job was all done. And if anyone was killed or became disabled, CAMCO would pay six months' salary to their beneficiary. And not written into the contracts was a promise from CAMCO that for every Japanese fighter or bomber they shot out of the sky or destroyed on the ground, there would be a $500 reward. What Chenault got from Curtis Wright were P-40s with their 1,040 horsepower V-12 Allison engines. The P-40 flew 378 miles per hour and had an 840 mile range. There were two 50 caliber machine guns and four wing mounted 30 caliber machine guns. And it was the P-40 that became the primary workhorse of the AVG. They couldn't fly over 20,000 feet, which was a bit of a limitation, and the plane was heavy due to the armor plating and thickness of the metal, but Later on, the pilots will be thankful for that. Japanese aircraft were usually rather thin-skinned and fragile compared to the P-40, but they were much more nimble and maneuverable. So quick and agile were these Japanese fighters, KI-27s, or Nates as they were referred to. Chenault had guaranteed his pilots if they went up against them one-on-one -on -one in a dogfight, they'd, they'd get taken down. Chenault would come up with a winning flight combat strategy that would confound the Japanese Air Force time and again. So in the fall of 1941, the story of the Flying Tigers began to take shape. They all began to arrive, each one encountering their own mini-adventure along the way. Chenault's initial plan called for 100 pilots and 150 crew. He got 99 pilots who joined for... 99 different reasons, patriotism and sincere desire in their hearts to help the Chinese, maybe not chief among them. 59 pilots came from the Navy, 7 from the Marines, and 33 from the Army. And to keep everything running, Chenault got 184 crew, including a chaplain and two female nurses. This amounted to a skeleton crew for an outfit this size. And the pilots mostly had limited training. Only a few had any real applicable experience in combat. The whole thing was supposed to be hush-hush, but on the way over during the voyage from the U.S. West Coast, someone had gone and blabbed about the mission, and the press picked up on it at once. Hey, what did you expect? All these heroes in waiting were all a bunch of rough guys in their early 20s who didn't have a clue yet about the enormity of their mission. Anyway, so much for keeping this whole operation a secret. When it had come time to poach all these pilots from the various branches of the service, no one was anxious to cooperate with Chenault on this. It took a while to visit all these bases and wave all that Chinese money in front of these prospective volunteers. The terms of the deal were so generous it was hard to keep the volunteers away. Aside from the instant promotion that came with it, the pay was two to three times what they made currently, and the hefty bonus for every Japanese plane destroyed was a real incentive for fighter pilots. Japan's three-all policy was in full swing when Chenault was in China. That was one of the reasons the China government needed some urgent assistance. Kill all, burn all, loot all. This was Japan's payback for the deadly Baituan Dajan, the 100 Regiments Offensive, launched by Peng De Hua in late 1940. 2.7 million Chinese will perish in all kinds of terrible ways as a direct and indirect result of this brutal Three Alls campaign. The Sanguang Zhengzi. In Japan, they called it the Sanko Saksen. That's why Chenault was in China. Chiang Kai-shek was kind of hoping Chenault could put together an effective force to soften the blow of this savage Japanese offensive. From the Marco Polo Bridge incident and all the way through to the end of 1941 and into 1942, Japan was a force no one could yet reckon with. They couldn't be beat and their bombers dropped their payloads at will with almost no resistance. 
When Chongqing was being mercilessly bombed during the summer of 1941, the AVG wasn't yet prepared to deal with it. There was only one single supply route left to get war supplies into China. This was the famous 700-mile long and winding Burma Road, the Dianmen Konglu. Goods came into the port of Rangoon down in the south and were transported up to Lashio in the Burma Shan State. And from this Burmese terminus of the famous road, the cargo made its way through the 3,000-meter-high mountains to Kunming. This was the only way. Japan had the east coast of China locked down, and now they had their sights on Burma and the shutting down of this road, which the Japanese military leaders called the Aid to Jiang Route. So, you know how they viewed it. Chenault's shipment of 100 P-40s came to Burma in crates, the wing in one and the engine and fuselage in another. They were assembled at their base in Burma. One crate fell overboard but was retrieved. That plane couldn't be used anymore, but the parts were still good and would soon migrate to the other 99 planes. The logistical effort to get all these aircraft in place, the parts, the materials to build the airstrips, getting the volunteers transported from their various bases all over the United States to the base in Burma, it was a massive organizational and logistical undertaking. Just the kind of thing the military was good at. But in Chenault's case, he wasn't the military. He was a volunteer on the payroll of the Chinese. So it was often the case where Chenault was often left to his own devices to make things happen. Daniel Ford, in his book that I'm using, goes into a lot of detail about this. You cannot imagine how big of a job this was in those pre-internet, pre-fax machine days. The first base was at Kaidaw Airfield in Tongo, 175 miles north of Rangoon. It was a former British base that they gladly palmed off on the unsuspecting Americans. It was a horrible place, infested with mosquitoes and conditions that gave you all kinds of unpleasant tropical diseases. A lot of the men, not just the troublemakers, were rebelling at the conditions. The volunteers found out the hard way that as part of this AVG outfit, they didn't get the kinds of perks that they used to have with the U.S. military. Life in Tongo was quite demoralizing, and some of the volunteers handed in their notices right quick. Chenault ensured they were given dishonorable discharges. Believe it or not, Chenault had to ask TV Song to shake some trees in Washington to transport relief supplies for his men. When they were all assembled, Chenault began the day-in, day-out routine of lectures, drills, and non-stop training in a P-40. Chenault's understanding of Japanese aircraft and their fighting techniques were well known. He took everything he knew and passed it on to his pilots. He was a masterful trainer and had all the street cred in the world. His men respected him, and he hammered them repeatedly about how to take on the Japanese Air Force. Quote, the way to attack their formations is by getting above them. Dive into the formation at high speed. Pick your target. Fire at it. Then continue on through, breaking away at a dive until you clear the formation. Once you're well away from the fight, climb back above them and do the same thing again. Above all, never turn with their fighters. The P-40 cannot do it. They'll be right behind you in one turn, maybe two. Don't even think about it. If you do, we'll be picking up pieces of you all over the jungle. They will shoot you down, gentlemen. Make no mistake. End quote. At the time of Pearl Harbor, the AVG had about 80 pilots and 62 combat-ready aircraft. They were waiting for an onslaught from 682 planes that Japan had earmarked from their arsenal of 1,300 aircraft to fight the Burma campaign. The AVG wasn't there alone. Up to now and pretty much throughout the war in this part of Asia, Britain was front and center. They had their interests in China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, and were the first to clash swords with Japan. But they had been beaten down. Singapore will fall in February 1942, and when it does, it will be the greatest capitulation ever in British military history. 80,000 British, Australian, and Indian troops will surrender. The Dutch were out there, too, fighting the Japanese. Remember, they had their colonies in Indonesia, which, of course, will be lost following Indonesian independence in 1949. No one was proving effective at halting the Japanese juggernaut. Kunming and Chongqing were getting bombed constantly. 
and people who survived were living out in the open, and although it wasn't Harbin or anything like that, it was still very cold in the winter. Chenault had wanted to base the AVG in Kunming, but for a number of reasons it was in Burma where the AVG first carried out their missions. The American volunteers began trickling into China around July and August. The last of them would arrive end of November 1941. Chenault had done everything he could to make this outfit ready. Each day brought a new set of challenges. He had already lost men in accidents. And in the next episode, in part two, we'll pick up where Chenault has divided the group into three squadrons. And although they don't know it yet, they're going to... First, write their names into the history books come December 20th, 1941. We'll look at those eight months from Pearl Harbor until the 4th of July, 1942, when the AVG was disbanded. When that fateful day went down on December 7th, it had a great impact on the immediacy of the AVG mission. Thailand would fall three days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, and their next-door neighbor, Burma, was next. And that's... All for next time. In part two, the legend of the Flying Tigers begins when they, together with the Royal Air Force and the Chinese, take the fight to the Japanese. Again, the book is Flying Tigers, Claire Chenault and his American Volunteers, 1941 to 1942. So, until we meet again in part two, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from sunny and beautiful Los Angeles, California. Consider joining me next time here at the China History Podcast for the exciting conclusion of the story of the Flying Tigers. Take care, everyone.